right, let's get started so we can uh, end on time. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mayo Clinic, the Mayo Graduate School, and especially Nikki Espinosa for helping uh, organize this talk on really short notice. Uh, my name is Jamie Sunsbach. I'm the lab manager for Dr. Peter Harris here at the clinic. And uh, what people may not know about me is I'm also the founder of an organization called BioAM, which is dedicated to building bio businesses here in Rochester. Uh, we really believe that the key to starting these successful bio businesses is community. And so we put on a number of events, uh, basically every month, about three to four events, to really tie together the community, to identify you know, the entrepreneurs and the risk takers in the community that will hopefully go forward or are going forward now to build these bio businesses here in Rochester. Um, we invite anyone to come out and take part. Um, you can go to bioam.org to see the list of, of what we offer on our website. And uh, we're really excited today because this is the first of five um, what we call Founders Series. Um, what, we're, what we're trying to do is um, bring in founders uh, along the entire startup spectrum for those who are just starting um, to those who may have done multiple exits. Um, and we just want to give you a taste for what it's like to be a founder in their own words. And we think that's really important. So um, like I said, this is the first of five of these that will be held across Rochester here uh, probably all summer. Um, I also want to thank Life Science Alley for their support of the Founder Series. Uh, if you want to check them out, lifesciencealley.org, I believe is, is the web address. And they're really the premier advocacy group for life science in Minnesota, but also the surrounding region. Um, for those of you do, doing any Twitter, I came up with a hashtag, which is pound bioamfs for Founders Series. So if you want to ask a question, um, but don't want to jump up and yell, just uh, tweet that and I'll be monitoring it. So without further ado, um, let me introduce Dr. Ethan Perlstein. For many of the students who are in the room, he's uh, very recently been where you are right now, been considering um, what he was going to do as his next step. And he can tell his story much better than I can, so we'll skip a lot of that. He received his PhD uh, from Harvard in the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology, um, and then went on to, pr to Princeton uh, to be a Lewis Siegler, is that how you say it? Fellow um, at the Institute for Integrative Genomics. Um, he's the founder of Pearlstein Lab in San Francisco, and really focuses his research in screening drug candidates uh, for or orphan diseases. And he's really a leader of what they call the independent science movement. Um, he's also one of the early scientists, I think, that I found on the web to effectively embrace social media and the idea of crowdfunding. So let's welcome Dr. Perlstein uh, to a chilly Minnesota day in April. So thank you, Jamie, for, for inviting me, and thank you all for attending. So my name is Ethan, and I've been academically sober for one year, three months, <laughs> and 15 days. Uh, and in that time, uh, uh, I've gone from washed out, uh, washed up postdoc to founder of my own uh, biotech startup focused on orphan diseases. So I want to share with you the story of that uh, professional reinvention. You can find out more about Pearlstein Lab at our website. You can email us there, and you can, if you're Twitter savvy or Twitter literate, you can find us at Pearlstein Lab. So our mission is, is quite simple. We do precision medicine for orphan disease patients. So I probably don't have to define what precision medicine is for this audience. But just in case, uh, precision medicine is just another way of describing personalized medicine or therapies that are really, really specific for a particular molecular defect that a given patient might have. And we're focused on the orphan or rare disease space. And I think, again, probably many people in this room know uh, are familiar with this. If not, that the strict definition of an orphan disease is any disease that afflicts 200,000 or fewer patients in the U.S. Now, there are, as I'll describe later, there are many, many thousands of orphan diseases, and most orphan diseases uh, actually affect 6,000 or fewer patients worldwide. So people can kind of imagine that there are going to be economic and scientific challenges to addressing the orphan disease community, and we think that we've come up with a potential strategy that can do just that in a scalable way. Uh, and I talk about this in terms of a mission because Pearlstein Lab is actually incorporated as a benefit corporation or B Corp. Or is anyone in this room familiar with the B Corp status? 
So it's, it's kind of a new thing. Uh, essentially, it'll, it's a new kind of corporate structure. So typically, companies are C-Corps, uh, or there are other flavors like LLCs, and although uh, that's a limited liability company, there, there are many options for one to do incorporation. Uh, and B Corp is this new flavor that allows for a company to balance, a for-profit company to balance uh, shareholder profitability with uh, a mission, a uh, social mission, environmental mission. And for us, I think the mission is quite clear. Orphan disease patients have traditionally been neglected uh, by pharma. So they are really the bedrock of, of what we set out to do in this company. So a little bit about my background. So there probably are aspects of the story that are, are unique to me, and I want to be very upfront about that. I've, I've been very lucky and privileged in terms of my academic upbringing and where I've been able to study and where I've been able to do research and with whom I've been able to do research. Uh, and I hope that doesn't make me too much of an outlier, but I think there are elements of my story that uh, do generally relate to the broader uh, experience in, in academic science. I've been calling the experiments that I went through, and then I, I see a lot of other people going through the post uh because there is this excess of PhD trained scientists to academic tradition to, to academic positions uh, and I think I just saw the statistic yesterday that less than 8% of bio PhDs will end up on, at, in a tenure track position although 50% go in thinking that that's exactly what they want to do um, so again this is my background I, I got uh, essentially spent 10 years over 10 years in academia in, in the area of what is called uh, academic drug discovery first in the lab of Stuart Schreiber uh, at Harvard uh, where I developed yeast as a model for for, for understanding um, the way drugs work, and then later as a fellow at Princeton where I had my own group and was able to uh, pursue further some of the ideas that sprung out of my thesis work. So that's where I'm coming from in terms of our milestones as, uh, as, a, as a company. Pearlstein Lab was founded at the end of last year. Uh, we're located in a biotech incubator that's administered by the QB3 network, and we're at their flagship uh, newest incubator site called QB3 at 953. Uh, which is a beautiful new incubator space, wet lab space, where you can rent bench space by the month. So it's you know 800 or so bucks per month uh, per bench. You can rent desk space as well. And the nice thing about this incubator is that everything is very transparently uh, itemized. So if you want to use the autoclave, you, you practically put in quarters, uh, but essentially you pay per autoclave run. If you want to have minus 80 space, you pay by the shelf. So it's very good for a young startup to be able to see uh, how much it's spending and be able to keep its costs down. The other luxury of being in an incubator is that you get to uh, benefit from a lot of peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. So, so there's a 20, so QB3 at 953 is a 24,000 square foot space, so there's room for up to 25 other startups uh, who can essentially share in this journey together. And what the Janssen Labs, which is part of J&J, &J, uh, has some of the space at QB3 at 953, and we're fortunate to be affiliated with them. So the, the, the scientific foundation for uh, what we're doing in Pearlstein Lab uh, really started uh, early on in my graduate career. And it's something I eventually came to call evolutionary pharmacology. And in its initial manifestation, I was really interested in using simple models to understand complex drugs. And the best way I thought to illustrate that was to potentially do the most counterintuitive uh, kind of pairing to say, let's use a yeast cell to understand how an antidepressant works. And so that's the work that we undertook, uh, that I undertook at Princeton with my team there to really understand how does this drug that uh, you know, supposedly has its well-known mechanism of action, how does it actually work at the molecular level? And, and we ended up, I think, illuminating some interesting aspects of the pharmacology of antidepressants using yeast, which obviously don't have any brains. They're, they're, they don't even have any differentiated cells. It's a single cell type. They don't produce any serotonin, which is how antidepressants are thought to act. But yet we found that when you treat uh, yeast cells with Zoloft, we saw an effect. And we, we ended up using a genetic, an unbiased genetic approach to just simply explore what that effect was. And when I was considering going into academia, I wanted to extend this work, uh, but that didn't work out. Uh, and so in the context of trying to build a company, I thought, well, psychopharmacology, as I found out at, at, during my time at my postdoc, was just way too complicated. We only started to scratch the surface using yeast. And I thought, well, I still want to use simple model organisms to understand disease-relevant biology. And what, what can I really do in the context of a company that could be sustainable and actually produce something that uh, would, would create returns and, and succeed? Uh, and so I thought, let me now switch gears a bit, still using this evolutionary pharmacology approach, but now let's take these simple model organisms and pair them with really s the simplest of diseases. And the simplest of the diseases are, 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 are orphan diseases, which are genetic. Uh, and most orphan diseases actually, um, or many orphan diseases, I should say, uh, are really caused by sometimes a single broken gene. 
So let's thought, I thought, let's marry the simplest model organisms with the simplest diseases and see if that is a, is a potential path forward. So every time you, uh, you, know, you have a startup, you, know, you, you have to break down the business plan into various sections, and problem is always one of them. So we have the requisite problem slide here. And that is 95% of orphan diseases have no uh, approved drug. So there are about 7,000 orphan diseases that amount, so, so that, that really translate into about 1 in 10 to 1 in 12 people. Um, and that's in the United States, that's around the world. The United States is only 2.5% of the world population, but orphan diseases uh, are really sort of losing the genetic lottery, and that can happen to anyone at any time uh, around the planet. Um, so there are about 450 approved, FDA-approved orphan drugs. Most of those all came in the last 30 years through the, the development of the Orphan Drug Act, and, and, and that was driven by a lot of patient advocacy. Uh, we have seen some movement, but again, that's still leaving 95% of orphan diseases with no approved drugs. Now, that's, that innovation deficit actually goes much deeper than that. Uh, and it's something that has been referred to colloquially by some as Aram's Law. So people with good pattern recognition skills will see that Aram's Law is actually Moore's Law backwards. So Moore's Law is the law that describes the rate at which you know, the, the speed of computer processing power is, would double every 18 months. Well, in the pharmaceutical industry, if, instead of looking at computing power, if you're, if you're, if you're measuring I guess productivity, number number of drugs per, per per dollar, we're actually going down in terms of efficiency, and that's a trend that's been happening for many many decades. And it's this trend has been recalcitrant to lots of innovations that have happened over the decades, including the Human Genome Sequence Project, which was supposed to illuminate the the genetic basis of disease, and and yet that that happened in, in early 2000, late 90s, early 2000s, and yet this trend of of the increasing cost of making a drug, the increasing inefficiency, in other words, has continued unabated essentially despite despite that innovation, despite other innovations before it. So there's something fundamentally going wrong with the way we approach drug discovery, and it's. I posit that part of this problem has to do with we don't really have a genetically informed approach. Now, it's that, and then genetically informed doesn't just mean you have a sequence. It's a little bit more than that. I think it really goes from sequence to having some kind of a good model organism. And that's why I'm going to come back to this idea that um, using simple model organisms is going to be, I think, a really powerful way to potentially um, uh, invert this curve. So our solution is a, is a patient-centered approach, and this infographic, I think, summarizes what we're trying to achieve. So again, the statistics are there are 7,000 orphan diseases in total, and that really computes to about 1 in 12 people has an orphan disease. But I said that orphan diseases are the simplest of genetic diseases, but that, that belies actually a great complexity. And, that, and one way that the complexity manifests is that even though you might have a single broken gene that causes the disease, there can be many, many mutations in that gene. And that's sort of reflected here. So I'll do a case study of cystic fibrosis in a second to really show this uh, in, in dramatic form, I think, with a, a real world example. But our, our idea is if you have this spectrum of mutations, ideally what you want is a drug that potentially would, would match every one of these mutations. Now, why would you want to do this? Would this even work? As I said, there's an example already out there from, this, from, from a rare disease where this kind of a precision slash personalized, really patient mutation matched approach uh, not only works, but I think is, is, is the path going forward. So are people familiar with this drug called Kaleidico? Anybody in this room? So this is a drug that's developed by uh, Vertex in collaboration with the, a lot of money actually from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. Um, and this is really, this Kaleidico was approved in early 2012 and it's really a wonder drug. And it really is an example of a, of a drug that works in a patient mutation specific way. So patients who have this particular mutation in their gene called CFTR, which is responsible for cystic fibrosis, our dear leader at NIH, Francis Collins, was part of the group in 1989 that originally cloned the CFTR as the causal gene for cystic fibrosis. This mutation, G551D, is present in 4 to 5 percent of cystic fibrosis patients worldwide. And that is often called the Celtic allele because it's enriched in people coming from, you know, Welsh background. Uh, and this drug, Kaleidico, works in such a way where it specifically alleviates this particular defect this, caused by this one mutation. Now, actually, recently, FDA uh, in, uh, sort of expanded the purview of Kaleidico to include about eight other mutations, but it still leaves over 90 percent of cystic fibrosis patients with, with, with no effective therapy. And the, 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 real, the real sense of the complexity comes from the fact that, yes, CFTR is one gene that causes CFTR, but 
or cause of cystic fibrosis, but there are 1,600 mutations described in, in the cystic fibrosis, CFTR gene. Um, and now, you don't probably need a drug for every, for every you don't need 1,600 drugs, is, is what I'm trying to say. You probably need, you know, um, we don't, actually, we don't know what the real number is. We probably don't need 1,600 drugs, but you're going to need uh, uh, some amount of drugs that correspond to all those mechanistic classes. And it's, it's what, what is shown, shown here in this diagram, which I uh, borrowed from Johns Hopkins, is that you have multiple classes of defect. So some of the mutation, some of those 1,600 mutations, they tend to affect the ability of the CFTR protein to fold correctly, in which case it never even makes it to the surface, and so that presents one kind of loss of function. But there are other of those mutations where, okay, it's not maybe not a severe mutation. So the, the CFTR, this, this uh, chloride channel, does make it to the cell surface, but it's lesioned in some way and it doesn't work. But maybe only one of its functions is, 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 um, is effective, the other ones are not. Uh, so in the case of Kaleidico, you're really talking about fixing this one particular defect that has to do with how the CFTR uh, channel opens at the, or how it's responsive to signals and, and therefore opens. So I think this presents a path for how one could create personalized drugs. Now, the only problem is, how can you do this in a way where you can cover the entire um, mutation space in one go? The, the story of this was sort of a serendipitous understanding of how this particular mutation worked, and that led to s drug development in that area. But how would you go about doing this where you could, from the very outset, uh, have patient match mutations uh, going, you know, going forward? Because now what Vertex is doing is essentially going back and trying to fill in all that 95% with other compounds that are, that are similar to this that can respond to, that can, that for, for these other mutations would be responsive. So a little bit about uh, the market here. Again, one in 12 people has uh, an orphan disease. So in the United States, that's you know, somewhere up to 30 million uh, orphan disease patients in total. Now, how is that, how is that market you know, broken down? 80% uh, of the 7,000 orphan diseases are genetic in origin. And of those, you see that about half are caused by a single broken gene. So of that half that's caused by a single broken gene, of those 3,000, 1,500 are known at, this, at, at, a, at a gene level, and that, that's typified by, cystic, by the cystic fibrosis case. So there's about 1,500 diseases that are very similar in, in sort of genetic nature and in inheritance like cystic fibrosis. Now, there's an equal number of another 1,500 that show the same pattern. If you were to look at pedigrees and look at multi-generational families, you would see if you were you know, an astute geneticist, you would conclude, aha, uh -huh, based on the inheritance pattern, this is, this is likely to be a Mendelian or single gene disease. But we just don't know yet what that gene is. And oftentimes you hear every week in the literature there's another report of a whole genome sequence done on a family or a whole exome sequence done on a group of families that finally identifies what the causal gene was for some uh, mysterious, well, uh, for a mysterious disease. So there is a lot of opportunity, I think, to, to, to apply a, a screening approach uh, that is really focused on looking at single gene diseases, which is what we want to initially focus on. And the way we do this is by taking advantage of primordial animal models. So our platform is mammal-free. Uh, we're really looking uh, at the sort of four big canonical genetic model organisms, going all the way back to yeast, uh, with whom we last shared a common ancestor a billion years ago, uh, then moving up the phylogenetic tree to worms, then to flies, and then finally the, the only vertebrate we have on the chart here is zebrafish. And so oftentimes people seem to, um, I guess, forget that we have a lot of shared ancestry. In fact, um, but I think there's, there's a growing awareness that, that there is this, this common foundation. In fact, there was a, a special on PBS the other day called Your Inner Fish. And it was a story of how the transitional species that was the creature that lived part-time in the water, part-time on land, that was, our, was the, the ancestor to all tetrapods, which was the ancestor to all sort of all eventually leading to us, and the, the story was, was, was remarkable because it showed you, well, look, the bone structure, and everyone knows this example, the bone structure of one bone, two bone, lots of bone digits, that's been conserved in every single animal that, since that creature crawled out on, onto the primordial shores. And so if that's true at the level of morphology and bone structure, it's probably also going to be true at the cellular level. If it's true at the cellular level, it's probably going to also be true at the subcellular level in terms of how organelles work and, and, and essentially how genetic networks are wired. And that's the, the, the conservation that we're really trying to exploit here. And what makes what we're doing, I think, special is, is not so much the idea of saying, well, there is conservation. Well, yeah, if you, if you sort of pay attention, you, you know that that's true. What, what we're really taking advantage of is, I think, a really unique confluence in time of this rapidly decreasing cost of DNA sequencing, right? We've broken through, you know, the, the, the sound barrier of genome sequencing where, where it's less than $1,000 per whole genome. 
technically, that's what Illumina says, although I'm sure with the all-in analysis cost, it's still going to be more than a grand. But you now have this ability to get genome sequence, get the actual specific mutation that a patient might have, and that's coupled with this this uh, renaissance, really, in genome editing, the ability now to take a genome and specifically introduce a particular mutation. So what we can really do is say, take a mutation, and ideally the way this would work is you would just get a mutation you know, straight off the ticker of a, of, of a genome sequence analysis, and then be able to, to use genome editing to put that into a model organism so that you would have a personal, a patient would have their own personalized yeast, their own personalized worm, their own personalized fly, their own personalized fish. And then you could do drug discovery screening on those model organisms. Now this only works if the disease-causing gene is conserved. And that's not always going to be the case. But I think more often than not, it, it is going to be the case. And we're going to be focusing on diseases where that is absolutely the case. So you might ask, why, why would this work? Why, why would you use these simple model organisms? Why, why would you assume that any of these molecules or hits that you would find in this, these screens would, would parlay into, in, into a, you know, in, in terms of activity in high organisms, in us? Um, well, there are examples of this, this pipeline working. Uh, there is a drug called Caprelza, which is shown here. It's a thyroid cancer drug. Now, you know, you don't have to be a Drosophila anatomist to realize that fruit flies don't have thyroid glands. So you would think to yourself, why on earth would you ever use a fruit fly to discover a thyroid cancer gene? Well, it works, actually. And the way it works is as follows. The thyroid cancer gene is really a, a rare disease. It affects several thousand people um, in the United States. And it's triggered by one oncogene. And what the researchers in Ross Kagan's lab uh, discovered was that if you express this, uh, this mutated oncogene in the fly eye, essentially use the fly eye as just a reaction vessel, it's just, just, just to see if this mutation has any effects. And what you can see quite clearly is that in a wild type eye, you have that beautiful structure. And then you get this sort of degenerated structure when you have the thyroid cancer oncogene expressed there. Now, that difference is the perfect basis of a screen. Because now you can simply look for a small molecule suppressor that can take you from that disease state back to the normal state. And that's what you see in panel C is the, the thyroid oncogene expressing fly I with this compound called ZD6474 and you see restoration of the wild type function. Well, we call that in, in genetic speak a suppressor. And a suppressor can be a genetic suppressor, another gene that you mutate that can essentially suppress the effects of that first mutation, or that suppressor can be a chemical, and that's what you see here. And even at the substructural level, you can see that you're really restoring the structure and, and therefore the sort of wild type function um, of, of the fly eye. And ZD6474 is Caprelza. So this was work that was done, the original work was done almost 10 years ago. Uh, so the, the idea of using model organisms for drug discovery is, is not necessarily a new idea, but I think it's time has come, especially when you marry model organisms with orphan diseases. Now there was a company in the 90s called Exolixis that had a very similar approach, and they used worms and flies to do drug discovery, but their target space and their disease space was cancer. And I think that was, was a problem, and, and, and it ended up happening, what ended up happening was that uh, I guess the investors in Exelix has ran out of patience after a while, um, and they had to close down all of their model organism stuff. And I've interviewed actually a couple of geneticists who used to be part of that team, and um, essentially I think they, they, were, they were sort of too, they, they came too soon, uh, and they focused on the wrong disease area. But I think now is actually, the time, the time is ripe to, to re, revisit model organisms in, this, in the context of orphan diseases specifically. So here is our platform. We, we call this lead gen or lead generation for uh, orphan drug developers. So we believe that we can operate on a much faster uh, time scale than, than most preclinical drug, uh, drug screening efforts because we're leveraging these simple model organisms. And the way our pipeline flows is as follows. We can start with uh, essentially mutations that are available for some diseases in, in public mutation databases. Um, and their frequencies are also known, so we can say, for example, Let's look at 10 mutations that capture 50% of the orphan disease population for a given disease. We can then take those mutations. Uh, many of these mutations are actually missense mutations, so they're just, they're really, literally just point mutations, one amino acid to another amino acid. And you can, using CRISPR-Cas, which is the genome editing uh, software that we're, or, we're, we're using, uh, you, can, you can knock in those specific mutations in the primordial version of the disease gene. You have these simple model organisms. Now, when, when you have, for example, in the case that we're looking at, the lysosomal storage diseases, I'll explain a little bit more in a second, what you see in patients is very severe onset, very, very um, 
in a sense, you, you, you see lethality. Now, the question is, do you see something similar in the model organisms? And you do. So when you, when you introduce, um, in the case that we're going to be looking at, Neiman pig type C, when you introduce point mutations that cause Neiman pig type C in patients into flies, into worms, those critters are sick. They, they arrest uh, developmentally as, as embryos. So you can use that just like you can use the, the diseased eye as the basis of a screen to find a suppressor that makes, it, makes the whole organism grow. This was just looking at a particular part of the organism. And again, it was kind of a Frankenstein approach. Flies don't have thyroids. You're using the fly eye as just substrate to do the screening because you really don't have any other tissue to do it in. In the case of, these, uh, in the case of some of these orphan diseases where the phenotype in patients is death, you can essentially see that same phenotype in the model organisms. And so you see a, a really nice kind of correspondence that's comforting. And then, again, that becomes the basis of a screen that you can conduct in high throughput, rapidly, uh, in sort of you know, multi-well format. Uh, again, the readout is start off with developmentally delayed or arrested embryo, end result, a living adult organism. You can then take those hits and then validate them in patient-derived cells, looking specifically at clinically relevant biomarkers. So in this case, it's sort of a one-two punch, where the first punch is using these personalized disease models, and then you validate or sanity check those hits in patient-derived cells. And then we do this, obviously, with traditional approaches of lead optimization and medchem to improve potency, to improve efficiency. And ideally, we would find that for, let's say, 10 different mutations that we knocked in in our modeling, that we may find up to 10 different specific sets of drug candidates that are, that are, that are specifically paired to those mutations. It may not be actually one-to-one. -one. It may be that those 10 different mutations actually collapse into three effective classes, and so we're really going to find three clusters of, uh, uh, of suppressor compounds. We don't really know what's going to happen. Only way you can determine this is empirically. That's what we're setting out to do. And again, we think we can achieve this uh, on a much more rapid time frame than most preclinical drug development or most preclinical drug discovery programs because we're relying on these fast-growing uh, organisms, and yet we're still getting a whole organism readout. So let's look a little bit more carefully at the disease area that we're really focused on. When I was a postdoc, we were studying uh, lysosomal processes because that's just we, we, we just we started to explore how Zoloft was working in yeast cells. That ended up just leading to lysosomal processes. Uh, that's just the way unbiased genetic screens work. And so when approaching the orphan disease space, it's an enormous space. Where to begin? I thought, let's begin with an, in an area of biology where I have some understanding and some grounding. So we're looking at lysosomal storage diseases. There are 50 of these lysosomal storage diseases. Most all of them are autosomal recessive. So this, uh, these diseases arise when you have two heterozygous, two carrier parents, uh, and 25% of their offspring statistically will end up uh, being homozygous for this mutation, and, and they have disease. And now lysosomal storage diseases in total are, are estimated to afflict over a million patients worldwide. And here's where the complexity comes in. Each lysosomal storage disease gene is caused by at least 50 different mutations. That's what, at least what we see in the databases. And we know that that's an undercount. And we also know that that's, that's actually, it's actually more complex than that because you can get this other phenomenon called compound heterozygosity. You don't always get the same mutation from mom and dad. Now, sometimes you do, but, so, but sometimes you don't. That adds another layer of potential complexity to, to, uh, to, to the orphan disease, to, to an orphan disease puzzle. Now, what you're seeing here is the distribution of lysosomal storage disease genes across these primordial organisms. So I said there are 49 lysosomal storage diseases. 47 of them can be modeled in the four organisms we're talking about. Only two of them can't be modeled in these organisms. In other words, only two of the lysosomal storage disease genes are mammal-specific. So we don't have 100% coverage, but 47 out of 49 ain't bad. And here's how it looks if you're talking about individual organism by organism. Yeast are sort of as you might expect, there are most distant ancestors, there are most distant uh, cousins, you should say, and we can only really model three orphan disease genes in yeast. Now, you, you, know, you add worms, you get you know, another dozen. You add flies, then you can see, and then, and then finally all the way on the other side, these are the diseases that you can only model in fish. So our approach will initially be focusing on this cluster of diseases where you can model them in multiple organisms. Now, we're looking specifically at Neiman pig type C because uh, as one of our first diseases because there's been extra de-risking done in that area. So academic groups have already actually published on NPC worms, NPC flies, NPC yeast, NPC fish, and documented that you have growth defects 
and that you also have clinically relevant biomarkers. MPC uh, is often associated with a, an increase, uh, in, an aberrant increase in cholesterol. You can stain for this, and turns out when you introduce neiman pick type C mutations, in fact, well, they really did is actually just introduce null mutations. They didn't really do it in a patient-specific mutation way because these models were done over 10 years ago before genome editing was really available. But even looking at these crude approximations of the disease and all alleles, you can see actually that uh, clinically relevant biomarkers are present in these models. So they, you know, there, there is strong reason to believe that these, these primordial models are actually modeling the disease. So we're going to start over on this quadrant and then eventually march our way over. Our platform will initially be comprised of yeast, worm, and fly uh, because those are the easiest model organisms to set up. Don't really need any regulatory uh, 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 overview there. Um, when we add on fish, they're vertebrates, so there's going to have to be approval and, and such, but not as onerous as, as what would happen if you were working with rodents or, or, um, or mice, or mice or rats, I should say. And this is a little bit about uh, how we're structured as a company. So there's me. For the longest time, it was sort of a one-person startup. But we recently closed a, a, a Series A round uh, and now have a, a core team in place. And our, our team is, is very lean and mean. And so there are two PhD-level scientists. Um, first scientist uh, was a postdoc at Berkeley. Um, and, and she did her thesis work actually in gene therapy, uh, did a detour in synthetic biology, but has now decided to return to the therapeutic space. Uh, our second scientist is a model organism geneticist coming a postdoc from a, a fly lab. Um, actually, the fly lab that originally generated the Neiman pig type C fly model, uh, which was a nice, I think, coup for us to get. Uh, and then we have a research associate who sort of rounds out the group. Uh, that's our full-time um, you know, our full-time staff, uh, in we, we rely on contractors to do some things that we cannot physically do or, or cannot afford to do ourselves. Uh, and I really, really, really highlight here Science Exchange, uh, which is a startup uh, based in Palo Alto that serves as an online marketplace for matching people who want experiments and people who can provide experiments. And the people who want experiments could be a startup could be an individual lab, um, who could be a citizen scientist. The people who are providing the experiments, core facilities, contract research organizations, potentially even freelance postdocs if they could get lab space somewhere and do the experiment for you. And Science Exchange provides this marketplace where the two can meet. And so, for example, our genome editing work is being done by the good core facility, uh, the good folks at the core facility at the University of Utah. And that was facilitated through Science Exchange. Happy Labs is an example of a virtual lab manager that allows us to sort of uh, offload some of the tasks, some of the drudgery, and some of the other tasks involved with, with putting together a lab, which are absolutely essential, uh, but uh, better done by the experts at Happy Labs who have made a startup out of, out of this to let the scientists do the science, and they take care of uh, the ordering and, and the negotiation and all that other stuff. Uh, and then to empower me as a web developer that has made our website. And we've, I've been really fortunate along the way to um, to have a lot of advisors who have helped uh, in this journey, including Linda Avey, who was co-founder of 23andMe, who was a really early supporter of mine, um, and provided a lot of uh, inspiration and, and input in terms of entrepreneurship. Um, and other people uh, are mentioned here. All of them, I should say, I met on Twitter uh, through interacting uh, with various communities. So uh, that's one big plug for Twitter, and I will plug, you know, I don't make any commission from that, but I, I tell you that um, the, uh, I, I'm a really big endorser of, of social media, especially Twitter. And so I want to sort of just conclude and then open up for questions, which I'm really, uh, what I really want to do is get questions and, and feedback. Uh, I want to hopefully have inspired you to, to come with me and join me on an orphan disease moonshot. There's 7,000 of these diseases. 95% uh, have no drugs, so this is completely virgin territory. Uh, if you're interested in solving Orphan disease puzzles that have a, uh, as their outcome, not a paper, but a potential therapy, uh, then please come talk to me. So again, thank you for your attention and, and really looking forward to questions. Model for some of the diseases. Is that because that gene wasn't present in the organism? Are there any cases where when you introduce the mutation in the gene, you don't get a uh, phenotype that you can? That's a great question. So part of the answer is we don't know. So if you look at a lot of the, you know, you, look in the, you do a literature search, for example, to see how many people have even bothered to model any of these diseases, say, in flies or worms, you just come up blank. So it means one of two things. Either someone tried it, there was no phenotype, it was a negative result, never got published. So either we have to reinvent that ourselves to determine that, 
or no one's ever bothered to even look. And my impression is that it's probably more the latter than the former. But one thing that we want to do initially is as we sweep across the space, we can do an initial um, you know, kind of test where we can just say, if we forget about knocking in specific alleles, what if we just created a null, just as a sort of first approximation? And, and it's true that there are people in the population that are actually null, so that those models, the null mutations, would actually be modeling specific patients as well. But you can initially just start by looking at nulls and asking, do you see any growth phenotype? If you don't see any growth phenotype, do you see any of the phenotypes associated with disease? And so my guess is just because the disease is present doesn't mean that you're going to actually be able to use that model as, as a drug discovery agent. But I think that's something you have to empirically determine. I mean, I think what would be interesting is if there, in some cases, wasn't, and in other cases, there were, then you have these different phylogenetic relationships. You can maybe pick out part of these networks that might be important for the, you know, that's another way of getting at that complexity. Absolutely. And what's, what's, well, I think what the, the approach that we want to take uh, is to sort of look at the lysosomal storage diseases as a group. Because it turns out that in some cases, uh, for example, with you know, uh, Sandhoff disease and Tay-Sachs, it's actually, these are two diseases, but it's, it's, you get Sandhoff if you get subunit, you know, the first one subunit of the enzyme mutated, and you get Tay-Sachs if you get the other subunit. So and when you really map out these networks in terms of sphingolipid metabolism, cholesterol metabolism, it turns out that they are all sort of probably more related to each other than they are to other diseases. So another reason to do these en masse together is that when you start to learn about one, you're going to get some spillover effect. But I totally agree that have, doing them together, you're going to find potentially some interesting relationships. I'm just wondering about the funding of the of this startup. So, if you're going to VCs or other groups, you know, early money is expensive, and, uh, and obviously you're in a space that probably has advocacy groups. So, looking at NIH, looking at these advocacy groups, probably have funds as well for research. Do you find any traction with those groups, or is that maybe not in the timeline yet? I don't know if you just explain about like how you're looking at cash flow, and keeping money in the bank to fund this, but at the same time knowing that you have to kind of move quickly, probably get some revenue. Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we're, our seed round is really, uh, really made up of uh, a syndicate of angels. Uh, and I met the lead syndicate on Twitter, actually. Um, and it wasn't tweeting, hey, can you give me money? Um, so our, my initial calculation was surveying the landscape. You know, the SBIR, SCTR route just seemed way too slow. Uh, and so for that reason, I sort of didn't really invest a lot of time in that. That really left, therefore, I guess, as you say, three options, VCs, angels, and then patient advocacy groups. For patient advocacy groups, I made the calculation that I didn't really want to ask them for money up front. I wanted to prove viability by getting money from, from sort of traditional investor. Uh, I've met a lot of the patient advocacy groups and the advocates. I know how hard it is for, for them to raise every dollar they raise. And when they do a gala and raise $300,000, that was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, more than the dollar sum you see reflected there. So I didn't actually feel comfortable asking them for that money. I wanted to be established viability from, from folks that already had a lot of money and that it's, whose job it is to invest, and, and then hopefully be able to go to the patient advocate group later and say, hey, we're viable, we're doing this. Let's figure out ways where, where maybe we can deploy some of your funds uh, in a way that you're comfortable with, in a way that really makes sense. And a lot of the patient advocate groups, I think, um, you know, quite honestly, I think, probably makes sense for them to be focusing some of their money on potentially a little bit more advanced candidates. Now, that you know you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket, and I, I think the platform approach we're developing is, is probably going to be hedging uh, you know, risk a little bit better than trying to invest in one particular asset versus that. But my feeling was you know, that money is so hard earned that you know, there are probably other, other uses of it that, that might translate for them faster. Um, so for the time being, no patient advocacy uh, money. In terms of VCs versus angels, you know, I sort of did the VC circuit a bit, uh, and the response I got was you know, not terribly encouraging, to be honest. Uh, although I hear a lot of talk about uh, VCs funding early stage, and there's an early stage innovation gap, and well, you know, my the joke I made was, well, you know, early stage to a VC is phase one B, and so it just didn't really get much other other traction from from them. So that sort of left that third option, which was the middle option, which was angels. And, and sort of the way things played out, again, the serendipity, I guess, of social media is through engaging with people, um, including potential investors. In retrospect, uh, that ended up opening up uh, an avenue of investment. So that's where we are right now. Uh, but but going forward, um, again, we have probably you know 18 to 24 months of runway. But going forward, we're obviously you know as soon as the round closes, you're thinking about the next round. So um, that's definitely 
on the plate. But for now, uh, we've got money in the bank and um, got a team and got uh, a plan for the next six months to execute on. So that's that's where we're focused. Thanks. Thanks a lot for coming to Rochester, Minnesota. I have, I think, a related question. Um, and also a big fan of Twitter because I was at South by Southwest where you were speaking and I reached out to you via Twitter and connected you to Jamie. So yeah, it happened to be that you were in Minnesota around this time. So agree on the Twitter thing. Uh, it's pretty amazing. But my question is, is about, um, you know, it seemed incredibly risky to go out and venture on your own. So on a personal level, you know, how do you manage that risk and maybe the fear that comes around that? What are your thoughts on that? Um, ask my wife. <laughs> She's the one who really uh, kind of had to bless this. I, I think part of it was, you know, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have a postdoc um, that really, I think, uh, allowed me to explore a lot of ideas and incubate these ideas. Um, even though I wasn't doing any specific orphan disease stuff there, uh, I think that time, essentially not all my time in academia, um, which was in a lot of ways de-risked by the taxpayer, by all of us, uh, because anyone who's you know supported by an NIH training grant, um, you know, is supported by taxpayer dollars. Uh, you know, part of this whole process was de-risked by a long incubation period in academia. So that really made me comfortable with the science of it. You know, but personally, things had to align. You know, I had to be able to, you know, have you know, uh, I essentially had to be able to convince you know my spouse to quit her job and move with me across, you know, from from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, and I know, you know, we didn't we don't have kids yet, so that that made things easier. So I know that there are certain personal, uh, there are things about my biography that are unique to me and probably allowed me to do this. But I think there are other things that are that you know are not terribly unique and that are common to others. So uh, you know, for me at least, you know, I was fortunate enough to be in a position where. I could sort of uh, take this chance, and uh, it, it seems to have paid off, which I'm, I'm really happy about. Um, and that's why I, I like going out and telling people about the story, because hopefully, there, if there's any iota of inspiration that can come of it, and, and other people can replicate it, then that just makes me feel good. Thanks. Um, um, great job. I have some questions regarding your um, using models to improve the experience. So what if you don't see that in your medical presentation? And the second question is, how relevant are the drugs in a human context? Have you ever done any trials? Yeah, so if the question about is there a phenotype or not, that's something we just have to determine. So. Uh, empirically. So that's why we're starting with the diseases where we already have some evidence from the literature from other academic groups that have already shown that there are clear growth related phenotypes that are going to be the basis for the suppressor screen that we want to do. So in that way we're hopefully initially starting in places where there are phenotypes and we can move forward. Where there are cases uh, where there are no phenotypes, at least when it comes to an obvious growth defect, then we probably will just have to triage and say, well, let's focus on the diseases that do have that growth phenotype and then come back to the ones that don't. And then maybe we have to come up with you know, non-growth based assays. I mean, the growth based assay that we're talking about is just the, the, just the entry level assay. We can build on top of that. I mean, ultimately, we don't have to just rely on looking on embryos either. We can look at even adult organisms uh, if they make it to adulthood and then do behavioral types of screens. Or we can do sometimes image-based screens. With the platform that we're building, there is also the ability to, to for example, look at larva and, and look at gene expression or protein expression of specific markers. So we have options besides just the growth-based phenotype, but we think that's the fastest and cleanest one to look at first. So we're going to look at that. Uh, the second question about have, do molecules, you know, how often do hits from these primordial uh, animal model screens, you know, make the jump the phylogenetic distance all the way back to people? Now, you know. The proof is in the pudding. Here's an example. It's just it's just one, um, but here's an example where you do see the jump. And in fact, ZD6474 is this exact same molecule. So I think you probably ideally would would want to do medchem and other things and improve the molecule. But there are examples of molecules that without without any alteration can can simply make that jump. And that's something I also figured out in my thesis work, where we initially started off uh, with a yeast-based screen where we were looking for chemical modifiers that affected the response of yeast to the compound called rapamycin. Rapamycin is a well-known drug, uh, also a well-known probe used in, in biological studies of certain, uh, certain pathways. And if you give yeast rapamycin, their growth arrests. Then you can look for compounds that either suppress that or enhance that if you give it sort of a sweet spot IC50 dose. So, we did that kind of a, I did that kind of a screen in graduate school, found a number of compounds, and those compounds, unadulterated, went straight to a fly assay, or I should say a Huntington model in flies, because we had this idea that rapamycin induces autophagy or autophagy, so enhancers of 
rapamycin, we reason could by themselves potentially induce autophagy. To test that, and its medical relevance would be in approaching apathy, where you might want to increase autophagy to alleviate the burden of a, of a misfolded or aggregated protein. Again, the unadulterated molecule that came right out of a yeast cell screen was active in a, in, a, in a fly model of Huntington's. Now, that compound wasn't pursued any further because this was all done in an academic context. The goal was to keep pushing that into mouse, into people. Um, other groups, we didn't get to do that. Other groups subsequently did do that and show that these molecules, some of those molecules, were active in mammalian cells and in human cells. So I think you start to dig around and you find it's not actually all that uncommon to find molecules that can make this jump, even without any chemical alteration. And then you think, well, if you start to alter them, you might even get more species specificity. But starting off, the starting off point seems to be conserved enough that these molecules are really uh, transposable between models, between organisms. Okay, so you're obviously going to learn a lot from these screens. So I'm curious how uh, your company's mission, how that interplays with intellectual property law? Yeah, I mean, I think basically, you know, the value proposition for a drug discovery company is pretty simple. It's the drugs, it's the molecules. So if you are circumspect about that, and you know, not just flashing structures all the time, then you should be okay. Um, the procedure that we're using, using a modifier screen, I suppose one could have tried to artfully turn that into a patent of some kind, but to me that's sort of absurd. It's like trying to patent genetics. Uh, we know that from the mirror decision you can't patent the gene, so this to be the logical extension is, well, if you can't patent the gene, why would you, how could you patent genetics? So genetics is sort of an open secret. Um, and if people don't exploit it, I think that's probably their problem. But I think the reality is it works. Uh, we'll probably keep some things to ourselves. It's sort of a trade secret because, but the reality is I do want to organize an orphan disease moonshot. And if that means sort of people sort of franchising our approach, then all the better that people are going to be sort of knocking this off. Uh, we actually plan to, to do a lot of real-time research uh, sharing, either on Twitter or, or mostly probably on, in blog form, because that's where you can do something substantive. But yes, we have to be careful about what we reveal, and, and the real thing to be sensitive about is just the structures. Uh, but as soon as you've protected those, you, could, you, can, you can talk about that. Um, what is your drug library, library like? Is it uh, extensive? 10,000 plus molecules, or is, are you seeing more benefit in, in the initial stages at least to focus on an FDA approved library? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you'd kind of be foolish not to start with the FDA approved libraries just because so many companies just sell that as a package deal where you can get, you know, 2,000 FDA approved, you know, compounds or up to 10,000 including some natural products and whatnot. So you can get those all <laughs> probably for 10 grand or less. And so, you know, most people in academia do pilot studies on those kinds of collections. And I don't think we'll be any different in that regard. Uh, in terms of sort of the larger compound libraries, I think to me the, the, bigger, the bigger emphasis is really going to be on hit rate as opposed to the overall number of compounds. I think you obviously have to screen a certain minimum number of compounds of sufficient diversity just to find something. Uh, but, you know, I don't think we're going to need to be screening, you know, million compound decks. Uh, I think we're talking more, you know, 100 to 300,000 compound libraries. And I think the real emphasis is going to be, again, on hit rate. If you can get that hit rate between 0.1 and 1%, I think that gives you confidence going probably even closer to 0.1%. That gives you the confidence that you probably have something that's really selective. Um, and so again, I, I would emphasize the hit rate as opposed to the libraries. And in terms of the library size, I should say. And in terms of acquiring these libraries, you know, that's pretty straightforward. There are plenty of vendors out there uh, like Cambridge based in San Diego, which for a dec over a decade now has sold, you know, drug-like libraries where there are no reach-through rights. You buy, you pay for it, it's done. You identify something, a structure that has an activity. That's it's all on you to be able to patent that and move that forward if you wish. So acquiring these compounds um, is sort of, you can do the commercially or through in-licensing, but there, you know, there's no shortage of compounds out there. What there is a shortage of, I think, are really good genetically informed screens. And that's what we're trying to address. Um, Follow-up question with that. I, pres I don't know much about lysosomal storage diseases, but um, I presume that these are diseases that need long-term treatment. Um, so how does your even so, an FDA-approved library doesn't mean that any of these drugs don't have the applicability to be non-toxic over a lifetime. Right. So how does that play into your initial decision? Do you screen them all and then, well, if you get a great hit with a molecule that has high toxicity over a lifetime, then just try to modify it? Or do you separate them out prior? Yeah, I mean, I think one, one answer could simply be to try to devise cocktails where you can, you know, include you know, other additives that could say, you know, either enhance efficacy or, or suppress side effects. So that, that could be one way to do it. 
you know, I think it's hard to know at the, the preclinical stage what's going to happen longitudinally over, uh, over, you know, a patient's lifetime, which is why, you know, thankfully there are surveillance mechanisms at FDA to, to look at this kind of thing. So I would say that it's, it's hard to judge a priori whether something's going to be, you know, have some untoward effect over longer periods. Um, and I'm not sure that that's going to be any different from a molecule discovered de novo versus something you repurpose, but I think that's something you just have to sort of see once, once, the, once the drug is out there. So I'm not sure other than you could potentially forestall that by, you know, producing a cocktail where you could convince yourself that with a combination of, of therapies, you know, you, you really enhance efficacy and suppress side effects. But other than that, I think the only way to know is to is sort of to find out empirically. So I am not a scientist. I'm an administration, and I'm curious from um, your perspective, I mean, you're in front of a bunch of students here. What are the characteristics and skills that they need to take with them when they leave here, enter that job market, and this, you know, a lot of alternative funding options available? What do they need? So for the longest time, you know, I never had any other email address than a .edu address. I think my first email address, first I, I basically, you know, borrowed my dad's email address in high school. And then as soon as I got to college, I had a .edu address and had one basically until the end of, you know, 2012. And then I finally got a Gmail address. And that was like one of the scariest parts of this transition because I thought, I'm not affiliated with anybody anymore. It's just me. Um, but I think that that's kind of the first step you have to take. And that's another reason why I really embrace Twitter uh, because it's me. And, you know, I don't get, I don't get the comfort or, um, you know, notoriety of, of an affiliation. It's, it's all just me. Um, and so, and I'm not saying that to be like, oh, I'm, you know, in a narcissistic way. It's just a reality, right? Um, and so that's another reason why I think blogging and, and creating a really nice website is, is, is one of the first steps, you know, to do if, if you're deciding to potentially, you know, leave academia. Because you have to create your affiliation for yourself. You have to, you have to create a brand. So I think in that a lot of people may be scared of that. Uh, there, there might be some prejudice prejudices even from academia about branding and marketing and other such things. But I think the reality is, you know, we live in a loud, noisy, c confusing world and, you know, things get simplified when you see that someone's from the Mayo Clinic or someone's from this place. Um, but, you know, musicians, writers, and others have proven that by their name alone, they can sort of rise out uh, from the crowd. And that's why I like to call, you know, the movement indie science in some ways, because it's borrowing from, you know, what, what writers and, and, and musicians and artists and increasingly, you know, journalists and others are starting to do. And even, you know, I think there's a strong, strong parallel between academia and journalism in terms of, you know, very similar kinds of gatekeeper st sort of structures. And, um, and then we're seeing, you know, increasing number of, sort of journalists go indie and be outside of their whatever label they were. So I think that the, the, the biggest piece of advice I would have is if you're considering leaving ac the fold, leaving academia, you do have to worry about your brand. But there are so many tools available, um, like Twitter, like a blog, um, that allow you to define yourself. You mentioned your blog for your lab. Are you able to use that as a source of funding at all? Advertisers. That's interesting. I, uh, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I probably would shy away from an ad model. But what I am actually quite um, inspired by is uh, there's a guy named Andrew Sullivan. I'm not sure if people are familiar. He's a blogger. Uh, used to be at The Atlantic and then Daily Beast. Um, essentially, he's a sort of political, cultural commentator. Um, had been affiliated with some outfit or another for a while. And then last year, he went indie and essentially decided to do, use a kind of freemium model where, you know, decided, essentially said, okay, for 1995 a month, or 1995 a year, you can have full access to the site. If you don't, you just get snippets here and there, or you like, you know, you, like New York Times, you read 10 articles in a month and then you're done. So, you know, we're building a drug discovery company, not a social, science social media company, but there, I do think there has to be a social media and outreach component to it. So I don't know exactly how to monetize or whether to even monetize the blog itself, but it, it's definitely, uh, something to consider, but I would probably shy, again, shy away from an ad model, but I think like Andrew Sullivan and others are showing, there are other ways that you can create really good content and get people to pay for it. So are you guys interested in publishing at all? Yeah, so well, I, I am interested in publishing for sure. Um, I only would say that we will never, ever, ever publish in a non-open access journal. Uh, make that commitment here, so if I break that, you can come find me and you know beat me up. Um, but I think, you know, the the currency we're dealing with is, you know, 
real current, you know, fiat currency, I guess, as opposed to the currency of papers. So there is not an immediate, you know, publisher parish ethos that we're, you know, living and dying by. But I think once we have stories to tell that are complete, and you know, essentially the lawyers are like, yeah, you can do that, you can publish it, then by all means we're going to be looking to put the data out there. But I would actually would say that we're going to have a way more emphasis and way more interest in trying to divulge and talk about um, you know, our process to, to the extent that's you know, uh, reasonable within the, the company framework in real time as opposed to in a publication form. Because everyone knows that when you publish something, you did that work two years before that. You spent three to six months in review. By the time it's out there, you're like, my god, thank god this thing's out of here. Um, we don't really want to have that attitude. We want to be able to do publishing where it's appropriate. Uh, but the real emphasis, I think, is going to be more on real time talking about research, and that would be through a medium like a blog or, or even Twitter. Uh, just a quick follow-up, just curiosity, because I do a lot of gene editing stuff. So do you have any um, QC on following up that your phenotype is linked specifically to your alleles that you're generating? Yeah, so we're making sure that we do some back crossing and some other sort of sanity checks. We know based on when you sort of the way you do CRISPR-Cas that there are, there are predictions as to what likely off-sites are to be. We can go after them, sort of traditional Sanger sequencing, to make sure that we haven't introduced mutations that we in place that we don't like. I actually would love to be able to do like a whole genome sequence to really say, hey, did we edit this thing in one spot? I think though the reality is a combination of back crossing and some strategic sort of off-target validation uh, would, would probably assure us that the phenotype is really linked to mutation. More question, I'm in a fish lab, so do you have any fish model that you're actually using? So the fish part is logistically hardest to integrate. You know, we're at this incubator, which is awesome, um, and we can set up, you know, yeast, worm, and fly. There's tissue culture rooms, but you know, there are no aquaria, and so there, we have to think about that more carefully about how to set that system up. And we're probably going to have to partner with a academic core facility to basically house and uh, maintain the fish. But uh, check back in about six to nine months. I think we'll be ready to to move on to zebrafish. In terms of phenotyping. Are you, once you generate uh, a knockout that, I guess, is modeling one of these diseases, if you run into issues or challenges that you can address locally, are you farming out the phenotyping to other labs or to other collaborations? Is that part of your model, I guess? Potentially. I mean, as I say, I think we're going to go through a checklist and starting off with the entry level phenotype of a growth defect. If we can say that that's there, great. Let's, let's run with that. If that's not there, we'll probably have a few other things that we'll look for. Um, especially many of these lysosomal storage diseases have been pretty well characterized biologically. So there are other phenotypes and biomarkers potentially that we Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Um, but effectively, I think the, we'll, we'll try to do the phenotyping ourselves unless it, it's something that's a real uh, tough nut to crack, and then I could potentially see doing stuff through a collaboration. But I think the idea is that we want to try to do most of this, the, the, high, the model organism stuff, we really want that to be our core competence. Um, so I would be inclined to say we would, we would try to pursue the phenotyping ourselves, but you know, I'll never say never. So another question, just in terms of modeling and um, more distant re related model organisms, so is your process of a gene or uh, an organism exists in those? You're going to kind of move it up the pipeline from yeast to C. elegans, C. Sopho, and zebrafish? Um, and if so, like, I mean, at what point? So if you didn't see activity early on, right. but you didn't see it, say, in a vertebrate like zebrafish, mm -hmm. how would that kind of change your, your how, how you prioritize the compounds? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, one way that I've been thinking about it, and it doesn't have to be correct, is that you might imagine this sort of progressive validation where you're going up up in phylogenetic complexity approaching humans and you're seeing that this molecule keeps doing what it's supposed to doing uh, between the organisms. What happens when you start getting a patchwork, you know, profile, right? What if it's only hitting invertebrates and not not anything lower? What if it's what if it's hitting in worms but not flies? Um, but but also fish. I mean you can imagine all the various combinations and so I don't know what it means a priori, and I don't know what is the absolute signature in terms of scoring in this matrix of small of model organisms, which is going to be the most predictive of efficacy in people. I think again, that's something we're just going to have to empirically sort through. But my feeling is that based on stuff that I've done and, and stuff other people have done, um, you know, your conference is now over. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think most.